great pleasure to, to speak today. I'm uh, the director of the Center for Gene Therapy, and, and Afruz is one of our star faculty. I think one of the best hires we've made in a long time was hiring Afruz to start our own lab last year. So it's I'm, I'm happy to um, um, uh, happy to follow her, and I'm really concentrating really on gene therapies, thinking about clinical trials for gene therapies. And this... There we go. So um, I think I skipped one there. So I, I'm going to, uh, this is a brief outline. I only got about 15 minutes, so, so I'll try to go quickly through. But I'm going to use the example of Duchenne muscular dystrophy in thinking about trials because it actually is relevant to some of the things that we're going to face with CMT as well and talk about how those uh, considerations are adapted for CMT and some some thoughts about adaptive design and trials. DMD is kind of an interesting model. We've had the success mentioned by Afruz of the uh, accelerated approval for four and five-year-olds of microdystrophin gene therapy. Um, but, you know, in measuring outcomes, we have challenges of this huge variability in just clinical care across different sites. It's better than it was 15 years ago, but a wide degree of clinical care. Changes in the natural history of disease when we compare to natural history sets because of the use of, the stero of, use of steroids use of other medications that actually have not been studied that could have effect on skeletal muscle function. And then the phenotypic uh, spectrum within DMD itself, variation in the, in the mutations that cause uh, the disease have uh, allow minimal but measurable amounts of dystrophin expression that might have an impact on disease. Some of the genotypes might be uh, milder than others. That's probably, these considerations are less relevant in CMT1A, uh, PMP22 related disease than it is for individual mutations for other diseases. I want to just give a high, I just mentioned a couple of these, some mutations, for example, predicted with Duchenne muscular dystrophy. This is a, a, a slide, just a complicated slide, but describing a boy who putatively had a nonsense mutation, came to our clinic, uh, wanted to be in a study with a, with a presumed nonsense mutation for DMD, was told by someone he had Duchenne muscular dystrophy, but in fact, despite having a nonsense allele, what was read out as a nonsense allele, it actually had an effect on splicing that allowed very low level expression, about 3% of dystrophin expression. He's still walking with no further treatment at age 17 years old. He's a manager on the baseball team. He gets up to bat once a year. They put a pinch runner in for him, but he gets up and bats every year. So these are the kind of things when we think about enrollment of groups and trials where we don't have a really homogenous patient population. In DMD, we have an issue of other genotypes and modified disease. And I, I think this is better characterized in the DMD field than in the uh, CMT field right now. But we are aware, and we have a large NIH grant in our lab to, to study, to identify other modifiers. In this case, these are phenotypes in uh, LTBP4, a, a, a part of the TGF beta pathway that has a clear effect um, uh, with that and a, in a, a, a variance in a gene called thro encoding thrombospondin 1. These two actually have an effect with protective alleles of up to six years of ambulation in, in more in complete absence of dystrophin. So that kind of variation makes some of the challenges in doing a, a clinical trial. And then selecting for the age of the disease. You heard about this from Dr. Rashnanaja just a few minutes ago. Um, in DMD, they uh, should be cho choosing the pre-symptomatic time course when there's a rationale for protecting muscle, but we will lose vector genomes as, they, as, uh, as a child grows, uh, as a boy grows. We, early in the disease course, we'll think, well, uh, functions are being acquired during the plateau phase, during a time when we can predict the decline. These are, these are important issues, and they're just highlighted by the accelerated approval where the group uh, for for Elevidus was approved for exons four to five uh, for patients four to five years old, but not for the older group of patients in that study six to seven years old. So uh, and then finally the challenge to approving to choosing appropriate endpoints. And I'm going to just briefly go. This is Katie's talk in a minute about outcome measures, but I think it, CMT has an advantage in this sense because of work done uh, through a lot of sites, including through the Inherited uh, Neuropathy Consortium that really has worked at this for many years. I, I This is my only slide, I promise, on this. That uh, To me, it, reviewing this, it was a pretty impressive amount of, of work to really cover what is looks like sensitive measures across each of the points of lifespan and correlate them to patient-reported outcomes, which is what is critical for thinking about FDA approvals um, uh, in, in the current climate. The other issue, we're going to kind of, don't worry, I won't do too many biomarkers either. I just uh, mentioned that biomarkers, you know, have to be a, a marker of pathogenesis. 
the ideal biomarker, biomarkers by definition should be treatment responsive, normalizing with effective therapy, for example, and reflect they should correlate with what we know about the disease and correlate with clinical assessments in order to be accepted as surrogate endpoints for accelerated approvals of disease. And we have to remember that they, particularly in long and slowly progressive diseases, like many of the versions of CMT, they may be more sensitive. They may be leading indicators rather than uh, lagging indicators of disability or, or, or uh, outcome assessments. And of course, they have to, they're necessary for the accelerated approval pathways. Uh, I'll, I'll just want to show a couple of examples that sort of illustrate this, I think. So in um, uh, this is the, the data that led to the approval of a Teplerson uh, from um, uh, some years ago in uh, 2017 as an exon skipping drug for DMD where the uh, surrogate outcome measure was uh, the biomarker dystrophin expression of an internally truncated dystrophin. And actually, the actual improvement was uh, a, a measurable, a significant increase in the amount of dystrophin is highlighted in the red at the bottom, still very low, far less than 1% of normal levels of dystrophin were considered sufficient to get this drug approved. Now, those of us who are clinicians who make use of it do believe and no more data has been published to say when we start patients on it young and leave them on it a long time, that there is a different, uh, 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 there is, it makes a difference in the ultimate outcome of this, of this disease, um, or at least an ambulation, I should say. But we can't measure that over the time scale of the trial itself. This is where this is approved from. More recently, this is the data from the first published Elevitis, uh, the Exxon uh, uh, skipping, uh, sorry, the microdystrophin study, in the first four patients showing expression of microdystrophin, uh, which uh, is a smaller protein. It's what fits in an AV, the gene fits in AV, but these levels of expression reaches a, a, a variation at the highest of about 80% of a partially functional dystrophin. Now, I, I have to confess um, the, the, well, the approval, the accelerated approval did not hinge solely on this, but really hinged on stories of improvement among patients. When we think about biomarkers, though, we're looking for some other things. And I, I'm going to throw, I had to throw one piece of our own labs data up here. I just wanted to do that. An alternative approach was the one that Dr. Rashnanajad's lab has worked on in FSHD and is amenable to other things. This is vectorized exon skipping, where we can get uh, by looking at duplicated exons, we can get levels of, of essentially 100% of fibers, as you see in the bottom row, uh, with levels of dystrophin expression at about about 80%. So we can improve upon microdystrophin with certain types of mutations. And this is a kind of, this is not truly a personalized bespoke therapy. It's an N of a few kind of therapy. And it's kind of the things that we're talking about when we think about gene therapies for many of the mutations in CMT. So uh, again, I won't. Uh, there's going to be more talks on biomarkers. Uh, clearly, this is recognized in the CMT field by people who see more patients than I do. But I want to just highlight the couple of biomarkers that have been described. These will be in much more detail, I'm sure. I just highlighted a few. Um, uh, certainly, with uh, uh, neurofilaments been discussed in talks earlier today, microRNAs and so forth. I'll I'll leave that to Mario to to talk about. So the issue is about trial design in some ways when, with these sort of uh, constraints on the patient population and what we can measure over the time we want to do studies. Certainly there's several ways to do placebo controlled trials with parallel arms or more commonly with crossover designs. But there are challenges to this in feasibility and recruitment that have to be considered by anybody designing a trial. There's you know, a relatively small number of patients available for clinical trials, particularly as we parse down, as we, as we sort of hone down on smaller and smaller groups, eight to 12, four to seven for dystrophin. Um, seropositivity limits the number of patients as well. And there's a reluctance, clearly a reluctance, I said, of parents here. I'm sorry, I, I cribbed this from a, 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 something about DMD, but it holds true for patients. Clearly a reluctance to take part in placebo-controlled trials. Part of that reluctance has to do, I'm afraid, with uh, the therapeutic misconception. We have it, and, and a pair, a physicians, scientists have it. Uh, enrollees, subjects enrollees in, who, who enroll in a trial have it. Everyone hopes that what they get is going to be helpful to them. And there is a, an idea that um, we, we know things are going to work. So that, that therapeutic misconception spurs enrollment in trials. We, the trials are designed not because we know they work, but because we have to figure out if they work. So in some ways, trialists take advantage of that. Um, uh, I don't mean to say maliciously, but we do to fill trials. Placebo-controlled trials in AAV are particularly difficult as well because blinding becomes an issue. 
every patient who's given AAV systemically gets nauseated in the days afterwards at the doses that are used for all systemic AAV trials. So blinding is a little bit of a joke in some ways for, for these. Um, we can tell with essentially 100% certainty, and parents know this, and they compare this among each other. And never, nevertheless, placebo-controlled trials are still out there. I don't know if anybody saw the news just earlier this week on Tasha getting uh, giving up the GAN program, which was actually had shown some signals of efficacy as it was originally done at the NIH and Children's National Medical Center. Um, uh, but the, the guidance, apparently, it's not public yet. All that's public is this sort of information that uh, there was still pushback from the agency about about um, about requiring a uh, placebo-controlled arm. This is difficult in a disease like giant axonal neuropathy, which all the clinicians in here have seen, I know, uh, that that's just not really a, a, a patient population where you can find enough patients to do it and uh, probably not ethical to do a placebo-controlled trial. How do we get by without placebo controls? Well, historical controls, obviously, one of the challenges for GAN, although they did a very nice lead-in historical um, uh, natural history study. There's not enough natural history data out there, I think, to support what they had hoped to do. I, that's an opinion. I don't know that for sure. It's important when thinking about historical controls, is the historical control appropriate? Do you have enough information on them? Is it gathered, uh, you know, the, the, the analysis plan when doing against the control should be uh, defined before going to that control population because you don't want to cherry pick information for it? Really, um, when we think of things about uh, uh, large databases or registries, which are increasingly being used in the muscular dystrophy world, are they interoperable? Or if you're comparing uh, registries across countries, across organizations, do they really capture the same sort of information in the same way? And then and really probably the best is natural history trial data, where there is sufficient information based on that. And that's one of the reasons, actually, I think the CMT field is ahead of the game compared to uh, compared to many other diseases, although the DMD world has worked for some time on this as well to to really get get up to uh, to have this information in hand, uh, it allows for the development of meaningful uh, outcome measures and may establish clear enough progression data to confirm effect. So, despite this, of course, the biggest success in gene therapy so far, in fact, required no placebo arm at all. In this case, the disease SMA. This is from the original SMA paper, where every patient treated in this, essentially we knew from natural history data that by age, by age 20 months, 92% of patients were, would be expected to be dead or on a ventilator. And all of the patients in the trial at both doses uh, survived that. It was absolutely crystal clear. So unfortunately, most of the diseases we study are not SMA. It's really much more complicated. We don't have such a clear signal for it. You know, to, one approach to addressing these things are adaptive designs, which uh, people is kind of a, 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 a common word in gene therapies now. In an adaptive design, it allows for the analysis of data at a predefined time point and re, uh, reconsidering the, or either the organization of the trial, or as I'll show you a couple of other ways, dose strategies or enrollment of the trial. Some of the examples would be refining the sample size, abandoning treatments or doses, changing allocations uh, of ratios to trial arms, identifying those patients who seem most likely to benefit and focusing that treatment in the trial on them, or stopping the whole trial at an earlier stage due to lack of efficacy. There are multiple types. Here's an example of sample reassessment. If there are worse sizes, worse interim results than expected, the sample size can be reassessed and power calculations redone. Uh, changes to the randomization protocol, or enrichment of those groups that seem to have the most promising results. The key to a successful adaptive trial is that, um, well, so these might prove much more palatable to patients. That's a clear thing as we think about the design of these. So um, because recruitment to futile trials will stop earlier with proper adaptive design. Fewer patients will be randomized to doses that are not beneficial. This is really quite common in the D, in the in the gene therapy world now, where dose there's dose escalation in the first patients, sentinel patients, and toler, toleration of dose, and seeing if there is a, it seems to be a beneficial effect, and uh, so and, and parents do patients don't want to be the first person in at a dose that they are not if there's a better chance a, a later dose will be beneficial to them. So adaptive design allows the chance for on average to have fewer fewer patients in trial. 
underpowered trials would be pre, re, uh, would may be prevented. Um, uh, so, and the, the patient population most likely to benefit will get identified earlier. That's a key thing. So um, most important, perhaps, it allows the possibility of reaching a definitive conclusion of the utility of an investigative agent first. Sorry, the light's flashing, so I'll hurry up very quickly. I'm sorry about that. The, the key here is that these require predefined rules for uh, adaptation. Otherwise, they're ad hoc. So you, the time points have to be defined beforehand. And um, with those predefined moments, there should be significant modeling beforehand about what these changes might do to the power. And you need to clearly communicate this information to participants So this. So with that, I'll just refer people to some really great guidance that's available from the FDA uh, regarding uh, uh, here one's DMD specific, but on adaptive trial design and gene therapy trials. Um, and I didn't mean to include expanded access. I'll just close here uh, with a couple of comments. Uh, it's still the problem of placebo control being favorite problem and benefit. This is, you know, if we can, if we can manage the trial, it's the, it still remains a gold standard. Um, but attention to adaptive design, particularly in the gene therapies, is important. So with that, I'll close. Thank you very much. I hope we have, are we holding questions to the end? Or, okay. Um, so I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me to participate in the um, clinical trial planning session. Uh, my focus will be on clinical trial outcome um, assessments, which is a background of physical therapy that kind of lends itself to how do we measure um, individuals who have weakness and, and um, changes in their function. I'm here in my disclosures. Um, so we've certainly heard lots about the therapeutic pipeline and all of the exciting work that's being done in this area. Um, lots of different phases of trials, lots of different types of, of potential therapies. But how do we get those um, potential therapies to treatments for people with CMT? Um, and certainly um, all the, the discussion that we just had on uh, clinical trials is great. Um, but the things that I think about um, certainly in rare conditions is thinking about the, the sample of individuals that we will be drawing um, for research um, populations, making sure that they're um, homogeneous enough to see changes in, in the strength and function, but also diverse enough to maximize and um, the generalizability of the findings. Um, and certainly the area that I'll focus on the most are looking at the um, reliability, the validity, and the sensitivity of outcome measures. Um, and again, using natural history data to understand how these measures may change. But like Dr. Flanagan said, it um, you know, that they may they were measuring them as they respond to disease progression, and they may be different um, in response to treatment. I mean, I think the other big thing that we need to consider is uh, making sure that the changes that we measure are clinically meaningful. So it may, we may be able to statistically measure change, but is that meaningful to individuals living with the disease? Um, so while the ascorbic acid um, studies were all negative, it certainly, I guess I would consider this the early momentum phase um, because it really spurred a lot of international collaboration and work and really led the path down from a clinical outcome assessment of what is needed for um, future studies. Um, so while, while it was definitely um, upsetting that, that, that we didn't come up with treatments, I think we learned a lot. Um, and then more recently, we also had the Acceleron study that also led to some additional lessons learned. Um, and this was a um, myostatin inhibitor that was locally acting, and it was injected into the um, tibialis, tibialis anterior muscle. Um, with the primary outcome measures of increasing muscle volume, um, was, was the primary and the secondary me measures of uh, changes in strength and function. Um, and while they did show changes and an increase in muscle volume, and they showed um, positive um, improvement in strength as measured by manual muscle testing, they didn't see changes in handheld my uh, mus handheld dynamometry muscle testing, another form of strength testing, um, and they didn't see the changes in in function. And um, I think the lessons learned here is that the trial design was an open label um, phase one, followed by a six month randomized control trial, and then a six month open label. And really, at the early um, parts of their the study, um, they had um, the functional change functional tests changed it about the same in the same way, and it really led to thinking about the the placebo or learning effect that can be noted with functional tests. 
And again, taking that forward into how we think about um, designing clinical trials now. Um, so as mentioned, um, a lot of this work with the, um, the ascorbic acid studies really led to this international collaboration, the INC, um, really now with 20 sites globally and, and continuing to grow. But this was um, initially established to create more disease-specific outcome measures, as well as to collect natural history data. Um, and so we have been collecting a lot of natural history data. We currently have over 7,000 participants, and I think you had even probably a more updated number than I have. So um, lots of work being done by the um, INC. The CMTNS was the um, primary outcome measure for a lot of the ascorbic acid studies. And um, again, this was the original disease-specific measure that was being used um, to, to detect change. And it is uh, made up of three patient-reported items, uh, then four clinician-observed items, and then two neurophysiologic um, assessments, which we know aren't super popular. Um, we don't always collect them in natural history studies because of of that. So we also have the CMTES, which is a subscale that includes just the three patient reported items, as well as the four clinician observed items. Um, but following the ascorbic acid studies, um, a second version of the CMTNS was um, created, and then it was um, further rash analyzed and scored um, to, again, increase the sensitivity of the measure. And while it did do this, um, it still has limitations in the type of information that it provides. It really more provides things at an impairment level um, versus a functional level. Um, so again, coming out of the ascorbic acid studies, this is really where um, the work began on designing um, future further clinical outcome assessments. And the CMT pediatric scale was developed and validated. Um, in the in hopes of being able to better measure function and function uh, functional measures being needed for uh, regu regulatory approval. And the CMT pediatric sale led by Josh Burns um, in Sydney, Australia, it has 11 um, different items. And these items really span the areas that are affected um, for many individuals with CMT, measurements of hand function, uh, strength, um, sensation, balance, and then mobility. Um, it's scored in the sense that the raw data is um, compared to normative values and then um, converted into a Z-score for standard deviations from normal and assigned a 0 to 4 with higher scores indicating worsening function. It's been um, found to be reliable and validated for children ages 3 to 20, um, so even branching up into the, the higher ages. But as was mentioned earlier, um, it may be more advantageous to treat earlier, um, certainly with the axonal loss and demyelination that happens at an early age. So we needed to have outcome measures that could also span um, that age group. And so the CMT infant scale was also developed. And this is a rash built scale that now has 15 items. Um, this is more scored based on um, whether or not you can complete a task or not complete a task or whether you use, you use compensated uh, methodology to complete a task. And so the scores are zero to three, zero to two, or zero to one, depending on the task. And this has been shown to be reliable and valid in infants and toddlers um, from zero to four. I'm certainly a little bit more challenging to collect um, natural history data, but there is um, efforts in this in this area as well. And then to round out on your, you had nice, uh, the, the longitudinal lifespan uh, look at things um, is a CMT functional outcome measure. So now we're looking at um, how do we measure things in adults. Up until this point, it was really the CMTNS that was used um, to measure uh, functional change in, in adults. And like I said, that really is measuring more of an impairment level. And so the CMT FOM is really modeled after the CMT pediatric scale, um, really trying to make sure that we had um, kind of that lifespan of, of measurement. And so we have nine items that overlap with the CMT PEDS. It's scored the same in terms of comparing nor to normative values and then assigning zeros to fours um, depending on um, the standard deviation from normal. The items that were removed were more items that were more um, applicable to kids. So um, the long jump and uh, balance items were the ones that were removed from the CMT PEDS. And then we added in items like going from sit to stand and climbing stairs. Again, these are thought to be a little bit more relative to the adult population. Um, we have done some work in a study um, that I'll speak about in a minute, but um, looking at the reliability of the CMT FOM, and we were able to show both at the raw value, the scored value, and the total score 
that the CMT farm was reliable across um, international sites and uh, individuals that were assessing. Um, we did a two day, Tuesday study with individuals with CMT coming in and scoring them and then just kind of continuing to mix them up to show the inner um, inter reliability, inter reliability of the CMT farm. Um, so then flipping to like, how do we measure things over time and thinking about the natural history data. So the CMTES, as I mentioned earlier, um, we have cl collected, I think this is a six year longitudinal study to see how the CMT and S or CMTES changes over time. And this was done in CMT1A. So certainly a little bit more slowly progressive um, type of CMT. Um, and you can see that the change is fairly linear. Um, however, that only a 0.6 cha point change over a two year period. So again, that's um, one indicating the slowly progressive condition, but also maybe not as quickly as sensitive to changes as we might want as a clinical outcome assessment. Um, there's also been work done in looking at the change in the CMT pediatric score. So this is um, work from Kayla Cornett and she looked at the natural history study across all types of CMT that of in children that were enrolled in the INC studies. And so um, the CMT pediatric scale was able to show a 2.4 point change over a two year period, um, which is about 14%. But then when you look at just CMT1A, um, it drops to 1.8 points change over a two year period. But hopefully again, this data can be useful in thinking about um, planning future clinical studies. Um, there's also been work looking at the natural history in CMT2A. Um, so using the CMT-ES, um, the version two that was revised, uh, you can see that autosomal dominant changes, it's a little bit more um, progressive than CMT1A with a 1.2 uh, point change over a two year period. And the autosomal recessive being a little bit milder with a little bit less change. And then when we look at the um, autosomal dominant and autosomal recessive ones, using the CMT peds, we noted a 2.2 point change over a one year period, and then a four point change over a um, two year period. So again, a little bit um, difference between the uh, CMT ES um, scales and the, the CMT pediatric scale. Um, and so to fill the gap, because we don't have that same natural history data in, um, in adults, is we've been looking at um, in a study um, by David Herman at the University of Rochester, looking at 215 individuals with CMT1A. Uh, mainly this was to fill the gap and validate the CMT farm and also to look at biomarkers, but we'll also have the longitudinal um, data to give us uh, how these biomarkers and, and the CMT farm change over time. And so this study is still underway. Um, we're you know hoping to finish up in the next 18 to 24 months with 36 um, month follow-ups with all of the individuals in the study. Um, and we'll have um, that the responsiveness of those outcome measures uh, to again, to help with clinical trial planning in the future. Um, switching gears a little bit, we also wanted to look at um, the advances in technology and kind of thinking, thinking about digital outcome measures and the things that we can use um, to assess gait and balance in different ways. And so um, there has been some preliminary data using 3D motion analysis labs. So those are labs that use cameras, lots of different cameras and markers on bodies um, to be able to detect change in movement um, and to look at um, how people's gait pattern may change over time. And so there was that early data. And so now that the you know advances in technology have led to wearable sensors, we've looked at how we can apply sensors to the body. Um, in particular for this study, we've had them worn at the waist and at the two feet um, to look at changes in gait and balance param parameters um, while people are performing functional tasks in hopes that they may be more sensitive to change than the, the timed function tasks that we sometimes use. Um, so this is work that is being done in both um, adults and children um, across five to seven sites in the INC as well. And we also wanted to look at digital technology and thinking about um, accelerometers or actographs, activity monitors, to look at how people um, move in their, their natural environment. Um, you know, many, many clinical trials, you come in for a study visit, we get a one-time snapshot of how a person's feeling and functioning on a particular day. But how do we measure things in their natural environment and what they do on a day-to-day -day basis with the hopes that a treatment would improve what their day-to-day -day activity is like. Um, and so 
We're also looking at um, activity using an actigraph in which individuals wear it on their hip for seven days following their in-person assessment. And the data types of data that we can get from this are more like step count, the time that's spent in different activity levels, and as well as the time that's spent um, sedentary. Just some preliminary baseline data. Um, this is looking at the wearable sensors um, and measuring gait and balance. So we have the CMT FOM on the vertical axis and then gait speed and postural sway. So a measure of gait and a measure of balance on the horizontal axes. And you can see that these, um, these uh, parameters of gait and balance are well associated with the uh, functional measures that we get in the clinic. In terms of clinical trial planning, um, things that I think about are the importance of standardizing all of these clinical outcome assessments. And when we talk about standardizing them, that means standardizing the equipment that's used to measure them, standardizing the environment that's done, that's used to, to um, perform these assessments in, and standardizing how um, the clinical evaluators administer these outcome assessments. And so we spend a lot of time doing training, making sure that everyone has the same equipment and has the same site and has the same training so that we reduce as much variability as we possibly can in the clinical outcome assessments. Um, there's didactic training, so going over how to do the assessments, hands-on training, actually having evaluators perform them, and then looking at the reliability of the assessments. Again, really trying to minimize any of the variability that comes from um, the administration of the outcome assessments. Um, we've also conducted refresher training over the course of studies, um, certainly challenges to the, all of this during the pandemic. Um, but, but again, I just want to highlight the importance of the standardization of, standardization of outcome assessments as we move forward to clinical trials. Other things that we want, may want to consider too um, are study design. So considering the um, administering the clinical outcome assessments twice over the start of the study. Um, just like the clinical evaluators have to practice and get to know the assessments, um, patients also need to get to know the assessments too. And so I think there's some ad, um, advantages to trying to reduce learning effect and practice effect that happens um, at the early, early start of the study. And so having um, them administered twice at the beginning of the study before any treatment is administered um, can be um, helpful to understand the variability in the sample, as well as, like I said, to get the, the individuals um, used to performing them. Um, other things to think about are standards of care. We know that there's a lot of heterogeneity in the disease, and you kind of alluded to this too. Um, you know, people are different, the care is different, and so thinking about having standard guidelines for um, practice of care, and this was initiated for the pediatric um, CMT patients from FEU's um, publication. And then we also need to kind of consider the influence of things that we may not always have control over, things like physical activity, exercise, diet, um, that also may um, contribute to how a person responds to treatment how, or, or to an investigational agent, um, as well as, as how, they, um, how, how it relates to their particular disease progression. Um, in terms of next steps for us, um, we'll be working on finalizing the CMT FOM data and determining the responsiveness for that. Um, we need to understand how the scores from the CMT infant to the CMT piece to the CMT FOM, how they relate with each other. Um, and then this may not necessarily be an issue for clinical trials because they're a little bit shorter in nature, but maybe um, important to know from a post-market um, standpoint. Um, we need to continue to collect natural history data. Um, we're seeing, you know, we're doing a lot of work in more of the um, more common types of CMT, but there's a lot of work to be done in the rare forms. So taking these outcome measures and applying them to more of the rare conditions and, and getting natural history data from them to be able to better understand sample size and power calculations, and then also to help inform inclusion criteria, um, knowing which patients may be best to be in a, in a clinical trial. Um, and then we also just need to continue to increase our knowledge, um, returning the, uh, re involving those external factors that we, we don't necessarily know so much about at this point. Um, and so just from an outcome standpoint, the INC sites that have been doing a lot of this work, um, as well as the ACT-CMT sites, um, my mentor, David Herman at the University of Rochester and Dr. Josh Burns at the University of Sydney, who's been mentoring Dr. Um, Kayla Cornett, myself in all the wearable studies. Thanks, <laughs> All right, so I guess I'm next. Um, 
So first of all, thank you, uh, Edwards, uh, Susan, and Pat for the invitation to give this talk. And I'm gonna basically pick up from uh, where Katie uh, finished her talk. So it's really kind of dealing with the challenges that she presented to us and, and trying to figure out ways to uh, overcome them uh, to different strategies uh, using biomarkers. Um, so those are my disclosures. And so the summary, we're gonna start by, again, where Katie uh, ended uh, with the challenge that we have currently, which is the lack of responsiveness of our clinical outcome measures. Um, then we're gonna briefly talk about biomarkers, definitions, and then focus on biomarkers in CMT, what we have uh, right now and where we need to, to move uh, to, to get what we need. So this is a, a nice uh, review paper uh, published in, in 2015. Um, by the European group uh, that worked with a lot of the uh, vitamin C trials, uh, where they report um, the, the mean change and the standard deviation of change of the metrics, uh, um, most of uh, which uh, Katie alluded to. Um, and then they give us this number here, which is the standard response uh, mean, which is basically a ratio between the mean change and the standard deviation of the change. So how well a specific instrument can detect change and how much variability is within that instrument, because the more variability there is, the harder it will be to, to get a consistent result. Um, the way uh, this is set is if the response, if the SRM is less than 0.2, that, that means that your instrument is very insensitive to change. If it's point, from 0.2 to 0.5, there's a small responsiveness from 0.5 to 0.8 moderate and above 0.8, uh, a large responsiveness. And the other, uh, interesting thing about this, and we're going to see in the next slide, is that you can actually estimate the, the, your uh, sample size uh, on a trial based on the responsiveness of your uh, metric. So as you can see here, most of those SRMs are falling on the minimal to really small responsiveness. Um, and that's really the problem that we have right now with CMT. And that, of course, is derived from the fact that it's a very slowly progressive disease. So I made this graph on, on GraphPad, basically putting the, um, the different SRMs and calculating using the LAMS formula, uh, how many patients you need on a, on a one arm of a trial. So the N here is for each arm. So you have to multiply by two to get your sample size. So here's where we are right now. Oops, that's the wrong one. Um, so here's where we are right now with the current tools that we use in clinical trials. Uh, very, very small responsiveness, theoretically very high number of patients that we would need to, to detect with an 80% uh, power, a significance of 0.05, a 50% effect size. So that's really a nightmare, just to look at this slide. Um, the best scenario that we have right now is using the CMT examination score in 2A, which is of more, I can say fast progressing, but definitely faster than CMT1A, uh, where you get a responsiveness of about 0.5 and 250 patients, but then 2A is way less common than 1A and you're still a big problem. And then if you concentrate in kids, the CMT PIDs in 2A had actually a, a, a SRM of one. So fairly decent, but still 64 patients per arm. For a pediatric trial on 2A, also going to be a challenge, but that's kind of the direction that we want to see our um, SRM move uh, to. And we hope that the biomarkers might provide uh, some chance to get a better SRM and a smaller number of patients. Unfortunately, I don't think we're there yet, and I'm going to try to make that case. Um, so biomarkers, by definition, um, is anything that you can objectively measure, so you have to be able to get a number out of it, um, that can be used as an indicator of either a normal biological process, a disease process, or a pharmacological response to therapy. Uh, we have many biomarkers that we use in common clinical practice, for instance, blood pressure and body temperature, which are physiological biomarkers cholesterol, red blood cell count, molecular or laboratory biomarkers. And then for instance, when you use an MRI to detect a tumor or a fracture on an X-ray, those are image biomarkers. Uh, we can also um, qualify biomarkers by um, what they're being used for. Um, so we have biomarkers to de uh, determine risk, uh, to make diagnostics, as I mentioned before, to monitor patients, to determine prognosis based on, on a diagnosis. Uh, but we're, what we're going to focus from now on are the pharmacodynamic or response biomarkers. So biomarkers that we're going to use to try to predict a clinical response uh, for a treatment. So a response biomarker um, shows uh, 
a biological response specifically related to a therapy or environmental exposure. Uh, it may act as a surrogate clinical endpoint, but as I think has been uh, mentioned before, it's not inherited validated. So you do have to validate that uh, for what you're looking for clinically, your uh, biomarker can be used as a surrogate uh, endpoint. Um, so you have to have solid evidence of that connection between the biomarker and the clinical outcome you're trying to predict uh, as your endpoint for your study. Um, if you have a validated surrogate clinical endpoint biomarker, you may provide early evidence of safety and efficacy of a therapy, reduce the risk of harm to subjects, provide useful information uh, for patient management uh, in terms of continued treatment or adjusting doses, um, and also allow the trial to be smaller and more efficient. Um, and overall speed the whole process of therapy development. So for CMT, um, the approach has been to focus on the main uh, pathological process that we know play a role in, in the CMT uh, disease and, and symptoms and progression. Um, so demyelination is a big one, especially for type 1 CMT. And there are several biomarkers that are being studied to represent or to be a surrogate of demyelination uh, in patients. Um, the other one, and probably the largest one, is axonal degeneration, so the loss of axons in the peripheral nerve. And there are, again, several uh, biomarkers that are being used to try to uh, detect that uh, process uh, in patients. And lastly, muscle denervation, which is a consequence of axonal degeneration, uh, so it could potentially be also a surrogate marker for um, CMT progression. So now uh, focusing on blood biomarkers for CMT. Um, the first one that uh, we've been um, reading about and following very uh, closely uh, is the use of neurofilament light chain. This has kind of exploded in, in the late, um, well, early 2010s uh, in, in, on, uh, in work in uh, multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, and then uh, was first uh, shown to also be increased in CMT uh, by uh, Mary Riley's group in 2018. Um, as you can see here, I'm comparing uh, the, the, their initial results for uh, CMT in general versus healthy control. So there's a little less than a two-fold, uh, sorry, a one-fold increase, so about, I think, it was a 60, 70% increase. Um, if you look at CMT1A, that's about the same, and it, it is true across the CMT subtypes, and it's significantly lower than another genetic neuropathy, amyloid uh, transteretin uh, familial uh, neuropathy, and also definitely way, way lower than in ALS. So this is kind of the first issue we have with CMT is that neurofilament is increased, uh, but it's not, uh, the magnitude of increase is not as significant as for other um, neurodegenerative uh, and um, neurogenic diseases. Um, but what really troubled, I think, the whole field is how NFL uh, performs uh, longitudinally. So first, uh, on that same paper, they published data on a one-year follow-up. And as, as you can see here, there's a lot of variability. There are patients where the neurofilament goes up. There are other patients that goes significantly down. Uh, and that's so it's all over the place. Um, and on a more recent paper, we've... Uh, Three year and then a second one, which I'm showing next, uh, for, with a six year follow up. This has been shown to be uh, consistent, and in most, or in a large number of patients, there was actually a decrease in neurofilament with disease progression. No, not any specific intervention, uh, and this is kind of the data uh, for the longer um, study, six years, um, with again a change that uh, varies in in. Uh, uh, 1A of uh, a reduction of 2.44, uh, 1X 3.28, uh, and this is across the board. Um, so uh, the group in the paper, they, they try to estimate what the SRM would be for neurofilament, considering that not only um, there's a small magnitude of change, but also there's a lot of variability within uh, the specific disease groups, and they estimate it to be 0 0.04. So that's really, really, really bad. Um, so that's kind of where we are right now, at least for the types of CMT that were studied and uh, specifically, and I'm going to allude to this later, the age uh, of, of the patients, uh, neurofilament doesn't seem to be picking up uh, a lot of, of change, at least in a consistent manner that would be helpful in a clinical trial. Um, Johns Behrens and, and, and uh, Johns Behrens and Michael Shai uh, did some work looking for now the demyelinating side of, 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 uh, of biomarkers. So they were looking for biomarkers that would be 
uh, increase in CMT1A and would be more related to the Schwann cell component of the disease. Uh, they use this uh, O-link immune PCR, which is kind of a, a marriage of uh, an ELISA and a, and a real-time PCR. Uh, and they could find a single uh, 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 transcript, uh, which is called, it's a long name, but it's TMPRSS5, which was consistently increased in patients with CMT1A, uh, two different cohorts and, and compared to controls, uh, which is great, but it didn't correlate with disease severity, with markers of demyelination on nerve conduction or uh, with age. Uh, but it did not show uh, increase in, in other forms of, of uh, CMT, including the de demyelinating forms. So that's a little bit concerning as well, but there were, of course there were smaller samples, but we don't have yet longitudinal data to understand what the responsive, responsiveness of this metric would be, but this could at least be some form of, of trying to detect demyelination uh, in patients. Uh, lastly, for blood uh, biomarkers, uh, same group, uh, John uh, and Mike, uh, looked into uh, microRNAs or reg regulatory uh, RNAs uh, in, in the blood of patients with CMT1A, and they did find several species, uh, some related more to Schwann cell biology, others related to muscle, uh, which again has that component of the, the muscle atrophy and innervation that happens in, in all forms of CMT. And they could, so they, they found several species, one uh, which correlated very strongly with neurofilament levels. Um, they all had very decent sensitivity to differentiate patients to control. Uh, but again, we don't know what the responsiveness is. Uh, actually, sorry, they, we, they have data suggesting that there's no major change over one to two years. Um, they don't have a lot of detail about uh, individual patients. So I'm I couldn't tell if um, it's no change because it's stable across the board in every patient or if it's like um, an affair where there's a lot of fluctuation and that will mess with the responsiveness. So um, in any case, still not a, a great a responsive uh, metric. Um, and then there's another way to approach biomarkers, which is using uh, imaging or specifically MRI. And this is uh, work from uh, Mary Riley's group looking to felt uh, fat a fraction or how much fat is infiltrating uh, different muscles of the calf. Uh, and they showed here in, in a few patients that as the disease progresses in severity, um, the amount of fat, which is uh, white here versus the normal muscle, which is kind of darker gray or black. Um, so the amount of fat starts to increase. Um, there are two things here. One is um, not only is the, the severity here changing, but the, the age is also changing. So there is an effect of age. Um, and also when they looked into how much change they were picking up, um, there was definitely uh, a dependence of how much fat was there to begin with. So in patients with a very small amount of fat, meaning the younger patients and less severely affected patients, this change was way smaller than patients that were uh, with, with that had more than 10% of fat infiltration in their muscles. Um, so suggesting that, of course, you can focus on this group of patients and get a fairly decent SRM versus the patients that have less uh, disease burden. Um, but the question is how much those patients would be able to respond to therapy if they already had such a significant uh, fat replacement in their muscles. Um, so there's still, I think, a, a, a debate on whether this what the best strategy would be, but if we focus on the least affected patients, it would be hard to detect change. If we focus on the patients where change is more likely to happen, we may not see a benefit of the treatment because the patients may be uh, just past a point where they would benefit from it. Um, lastly, skin biomarkers. There are several things in skin that uh, I'm not going to talk about just because of time. So um, there's ways of looking at the small fibers of the skin, and that has been shown to be uh, decreased in CMT, and it's been explored as a potential biomarker. Um, David Herman has work on confocal microscopy, looking into Meissner uh, corpuscles, so receptors in the skin, to also quantify axonal loss in the skin. Um, what I'm going to mention here is a work from uh, Michael Serda's group, uh, looking, first they, they did the same work in mouse models of CMT1A, and they detected specific transcripts in the skin of the mouse that uh, correlated with disease, disease severity. Uh, and they are now at a phase where they are confirming that these findings are the same in uh, patients with CMT1A and kind of honing in into a group of uh, transcripts that seems to correlate well with disease. Um, we don't have longitudinal data yet, but that's something that may be 
uh, interesting if it shows to be if it shows to be responsive. Um, there's a, a several functions that are related to those transcripts, um, and this could be a good thing because there could be a biological relevance to it, but it could be a bad thing if those processes are secondary to the primary uh, genetic problem uh, in CMT1A. Um, so a few considerations uh, as we reach this point. So this is kind of the where we are uh, in terms of both uh, clinical tools and, and then the biomarkers. So if you look at the worst scoring, at least based on SRM, NFL, it's it's there, unfortunately, and that's it's, it's kind of disappointing. And I think there may be ways to improve this, but at least as it stands, that's where it is. Then the, the, the tools that we are using right now or have used in the past for uh, trials in 1A. Um, and then MRI, again, in, in that select group with more than 10% fat fraction, uh, there may be uh, a, a way to go if we can show that those patients can still uh, improve with, with a therapy, because that will really provide a very kind of nice, small study to show uh, potential benefits. Um, those are the things that we're still waiting to, to, to hear. It's kind of what the SRM is for those biomarkers and also for the CMT form. So we're really looking forward for the ACT uh, CMT um, study results. Um, but one thing that's very interesting on, on neurofilament is that if you look at neurofilament with uh, age, uh, we know that neurofilament increases with age and that this is well known and it's an issue that you have to always kind of take that into consideration when interpreting results. But what's interesting is that if you look at the two kind of larger studies comparing CMT and controls, you see that the, the slope here, it's not that different. So it means that sometime very early on, NFL increased and then the rate of increase, it's kind of the same as an aging well, healthy individual. In this study here, that was actually the other way around. Controls actually had a sharper increase in their filament than CMT. And that is kind of, uh, I'm sorry, just back here. And that's kind of what I, my, my question in the morning was because of this kind of realization that we may be looking at the wrong time. So if we are really trying to interfere with whatever is causing the NFL increase, we may have to be targeting this age group and not this here, because the progression that we are trying to document and, 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 and uh, observe may be a process of aging of a peripheral nervous system that has been affected very early on in development. Um, so that's something to just think about. Um, and then, and, and, and that has to do with this graph as well, where you see um, the functional decline really kicking up around age 50. Um, so those are different metrics. There's the, there's a 10 meter walking test, uh, the nine peg test, uh, six minute walking test. And you see that uh, patients are separated from controls. And then at age 50, control starts to get difficult to doing certain things because they are getting older, but then patients have way more of a, of a higher slope of progression. Um, so is this functional progression a sign of a biological progression of disease? Or it's again, a peripheral nervous system that has already gone through the biological progression as suggested by um, the NFL data. Uh, and now it's basically aging and, and deteriorating faster from a functional perspective um, than uh, a, a non-CMT individual. So that's that's all to say that I think there's there has to be effort to do some of the work that we're doing, really focusing on the pediatric population. So really understanding what neurofilament looks like in early uh, CMT and see if, how soon we can pick up NFL increase and if the responsiveness of NFL is better in that specific population. And also thinking about when we are tailoring uh, treatments, uh, whether the age of the patient or the phase they are in their disease should guide our intervention. So it's very likely that everything that we're talking about here regarding genetic therapies and correcting the genetic a basic mechanism has to be done very early on because all, those are all processes that are happening very early in development. And maybe things that are targeting muscle atrophy, inflammation, uh, even uh, neuromuscular junction, might be able, we might be able to get away treating it later. But I think that has to be an effort from the whole field to focus more on early intervention. And I'm sorry if I kind of stay, stay too long. Uh, this is the group in Miami and thank you very much.
don't take up too much time out of your break. So if there are any questions, um, we can get maybe one or two questions in. Thank you all um, for uh, that talk. I've got a question with regard to something that's currently going on and maybe you give us your thoughts. Uh, the Farnex trials uh, that are going on, and I don't know if you're involved in it or not, so full disclosure. Um, they selected the LNLS scale. How does that differ from the CMT farm that you guys are have worked on so hard? And what's the relevant read out there that's different in your opinion? And why'd they pick ONLS? And I think they picked a 10 meter walk test as, as well. Um, and I ask in, as a patient, and I ask on behalf of patients to make heads or tails over getting into a trial and actually seeing something that is meaningful in their life as far as an improvement. I guess I'm on. Um, I think the thing that I would say is that at the time of the study, um, the CMT farm was still in probably even in its infancy as far as development. Um, and so they didn't have additional outcome measures to look at. Um, the ONLS is again, kind of a, um, I'd liken it a little bit to the CMT ES where you have a little bit of patient reported function and a little bit of clinician observed function. Um, you know, and, and I think at the time there was, there's limited outcome measures. And so they, they took what was available and I don't really have any, anything that I personally can say about it, except for that we're, it just continues to emphasize the importance of continuing to work on clinical outcome assessments. And, and again, with a um, robust treatment in, in terms of like SMA, I mean, you know, <laughs> you don't need the outcome measures sometimes. So, um, so I think, you know, I think we'll, we'll continue to find out and learn more um, as, as things come out. Anyone else has anything? I have a, question for Katie it's uh, from the online oh so over here yeah. um the question reads I can appreciate how specific standardization natural history data is more helpful for future clinical trials but I'm wondering about more general natural history considerations earlier today uh, one of the patient panelists mentioned how it was more informative to talk with peer patients to better understand common symptoms related to different types of CMT. Have you heard of similar sentiments from other CMT patients? And do you have any suggestions on how to help if patients feel that there is not enough standard or published information about what symptoms to expect for their given type of CMT despite the disease variability? Um, yeah, no, great question. I think there still needs to be a lot of work done in this. Um, I think our, you know, our early work in even designing and developing the clinical outcome assessments involved patient input. Um, we've had um, in, in parallel with the development of the CMT health index, which is a patient reported outcome measure. Um, we did a lot of, or, or Dr. Heatwall and his group did a lot of um, focus group and discussions with the patient population to understand what um, what were the important symptoms to be measuring, and that really kind of helped us choose which outcome measures to use in the CMT farm. But I think that work needs to be continued across all the different types of CMT because we don't have that knowledge, um, and and so it's certainly challenging when we don't necessarily have large numbers in the different types of CMT. But I think we still need to. Um, hear from the, the patient community about what kind of symptoms are mo most bothersome. I think the panel this morning was excellent in helping us understand that. Um, and then being able to take that forward and take the outcome measures that we've used and either modify them or tweak them to, to fit the other types of CMT. And just to add quickly to that is the role of the patient foundations as well. So uh, HNF has uh, um, the green uh, database, uh, CMTA has a database, and um, those are all kind of patient-driven in a sense. So I think that creates a lot of, of data for us to, to also base our assessments and uh, tools. Yeah. 